Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Susie Gelman. I am the immediate past chair of Israel Policy Forum and am privileged to continue to serve on its board. I want to welcome those of you who are joining Israel Policy Forum for the first time today, and I'd like to welcome back our returning viewers. Before we begin, a big thank you to Israel Policy Forum supporters. Our work, including today's program, is made possible by you. Israel Policy Forum relies on donors like you to produce free expert analysis and informational content on the most pressing issues affecting Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If you enjoy Israel Policy Forum's webinars, but don't yet support the organization's work, please do so by visiting israelpolicyforum.org forward slash support. Now on to our program. Two days ago, the Knesset passed the bill to block the court's use of the, the Supreme Court's use of the reasonableness standard in reviewing government decisions and appointments. This is the first official element of the government's judicial overhaul package to become law, which the coalition unilaterally advanced despite unprecedented opposition from across Israeli society, including the security establishment, economists, legal experts, the high-tech community, and so on. I would note that Tisha B'Av begins this evening, and I fervently hope that we won't look back and consider this past Monday Shisha B'Av. To help us unpack the implications of the law's passage, including what it means for Israel's democracy, escalating social unrest, security, and relations with the United States, we're joined today by Neri Zilber, a Tel Aviv-based journalist and policy advisor here at Israel Policy Forum, and Masua Sagiv, scholar in residence at the Shalom Hartman Institute and a Karet visiting assistant professor at UC Berkeley Law School. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Neri, let's start with you. You've been on the ground covering the protests for months, including this past weekend, when we saw a pro-democracy march from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, in brutal heat, I might add, and protests outside the Knesset in the lead up to the passage of this law to negate the reasonableness standard. On the flip side, we also saw a large pro-government rally in Tel Aviv, predominantly attended by national religious Israelis bust in from the settlements. What was the atmosphere like on the streets leading up to and following this vote, and what was going on in the Knesset at the same time? Uh, sure thing. So thank you, Susie, for that kind introduction. It's great to see you. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for for joining uh, on this, uh, well, momentous evening and momentous week, uh, really, in Israeli history. Uh, so to the body of your question, Susie, um, look, I've been covering uh, demonstrations of one sort or another in Israel for over a decade, uh, left-wing demonstrations, right-wing demonstrations uh, all over the country, uh, Arab Israelis, settlers, Palestinians, and like. Um, I've never seen anything like what we've seen now for almost 31 straight weeks and going on to eight months. Uh, really uh, unprecedented in both scale, sustainability, and energy, uh, I might add. Um, and this wasn't a given. This wasn't a given if we think back to early January after Justice Minister Yariv Levine's uh, infamous speech, uh, the first weekend, the first Saturday night uh, at Bima Square in Tel Aviv, there were about 30,000 people, uh, which, you know, it's a good showing, but nothing uh, that out of the ordinary. Uh, arguably, a lot of the usual suspects uh, came out. Second week, 80,000 people at Habima. Um, and I was there. It's a famous uh, demonstration with the uh, umbrellas and the pouring rain and cold. Uh, but really, it was uh, packed uh, over capacity. It was actually quite dangerous that second weekend. And that's really the reason why they moved it to Kaplan Street, the intersection um, uh, right over the Ion Highway. And really what we've seen now in subsequent weeks is uh, hundreds of thousands of Israelis um, coming out all over the country, I might add. It's not just a Tel Aviv phenomenon. This is important to stress. Jerusalem, Haifa, uh, Beersheba, Ashdod, really, north, south, east, west, everywhere, uh, coming out and making their voices heard. And really, the, the scale, sustainability, and really the energy um, is nothing like we've ever seen. Uh, to take one example, two weeks ago, there was a day of disruption. It's a midweek strike uh, by Jewish Israelis, I might add, uh, unprecedented, I think, uh, in Israeli history, maybe going back to the mandate uh, period. That's when uh, Jewish Israelis actually uh, took uh, took to the streets, you know, striking, uh, leaving work. And that day of disruption two weeks ago, uh, people were on the streets protesting for 17 straight hours. It was literally almost a day of a uh, full day of disruption. And you mentioned the march from Jerusalem. It was 100 people leaving Tel Aviv on uh, last Tuesday night. 
and we all saw the images uh, when they reached Jerusalem, uh, probably 100,000 people. Um, and then, you know, obviously, in recent weeks leading up to the vote on Monday, uh, it was almost on a daily basis. Uh, people taken to the streets uh, during the day, during the night. Uh, I think I've been to Kaplan, uh, primarily anti-government protests, but also uh, that one pro-government protest. I think five out of the last seven days or five out of the last eight days, uh, really, uh, I should be paying rent on Kaplan Street uh, because it's become my second home now for, uh, well, almost eight months. Um, and really, this wasn't a given uh, at all. And we have to look at the people who are coming out. Uh, and if you go and you look at the people, these aren't the usual suspects. Um, they're not uh, all definitely left wing. Uh, these are, uh, for instance, from the very beginning was the tech sector uh, that came out and then followed by the, obviously the IDF reservists. Um, two groups in Israeli society who were very apolitical, uh, stayed out of politics, uh, purposefully so, intentionally so, um, now leading the, the protest movement effectively. Uh, you had right-wingers, or at least moderate right-wingers, take to the streets, uh, people who uh, voted Likud even eight months ago, and I've interviewed them. Uh, so eight months ago, they voted for Bibi Netanyahu, and now they're out in the streets protesting against his government. Uh, bottom line, the vast Israeli middle uh, has taken to the streets, protesting against uh, this government, and again, uh, not a given and, and really unprecedented. Uh, Netanyahu, um, you know, uh, uh, awoke the vast and obviously uh, oftentimes very quiet and oftentimes very apathetic uh, Israeli middle. Um, now, we also see this in the opinion poll. Uh, by some count, consistently in the past seven, eight months, 60 to 70 percent of the Israeli public is opposed to either the substance or the method of the Netanyahu government's judicial overhaul. 60 to 70 percent. And we see it obviously out in the streets manifested. Um, at the very least, 20% or 30% of even Likud voters are against uh, the Netanyahu government's uh, judicial push. Um, and again, we see that on the streets. Uh, by one count, uh, at least 20% of the Israeli public writ large, 20%, so that's probably uh, what, uh, 2 million people, um, has taken part in at least one demonstration. 2 million people have, have left uh, their homes and taken the streets at least once. Um, and many obviously, uh, go again and again. And what, like we saw last Saturday, uh, there were over 400,000 people on the streets Saturday night, uh, all at once, all over the country. Uh, again, unprecedented. Um, and uh, that's just in terms of the uh, the anti-government forces. Uh, what we saw after the vote uh, was the same. Uh, so you had at least 100,000 people uh, on the ILO and highway and uh, at Kaplan Street on a spontaneous uh, demonstration to, uh, Tuesday or Monday night um, against the government. Uh, and what you saw now uh, after the vote became a, a fait accompli is more anger, more anger. Uh, they're not going anywhere by any stretch of the imagination. The protest movement called for a demonstration tomorrow night uh, as well as Saturday night. Uh, so they plan to escalate, uh, but a lot of uh, a growing anger uh, on the streets and also a lot of young people. Um, again, not a given, uh, been seen Israeli, uh, the Israeli youth were seen either, either as apathetic or more right wing. Uh, they've proven that they're neither. Um, so that's just on one side of the ledger. And then the other side of the ledger, the, the pro-government forces. Um, I attended two major rallies uh, in recent months, one, the, the really big one in Jerusalem for the reform, as they see it, about 250,000 people uh, in Jerusalem. And then uh, last this past Sunday night, uh, on the eve of the vote, uh, about 100,000 people came out. And, and like you said, mostly uh, religious nationalists uh, with uh, kippot and the like, uh, but also what seemed like kind of uh, classic mainstream Likud voters, uh, right-wing uh, Israelis, uh, but really 100,000 people came out, uh, a decent showing in what they term uh, enemy territory, uh, but it, it's interesting to my mind that the, the rhetoric has been consistent now, uh, that uh, this will be familiar to some of you, that it was, uh, you know, don't steal our elections, we have a mandate to push through uh, these reforms as they see it, and they want to give power back uh, to the people. This was a very clear message, give power back to the people, because in their minds, they're the majority. They're the majority because uh, they won uh, the recent election last November. Um, again, uh, I would I would dispute that characterization. Yes, they won the election. Uh, by the way, uh, the popular vote, uh, as many here know, uh, they lost, I'd argue, by 30,000 votes. But again, the Israeli system being the Israeli system, uh, they won a clear parliamentary majority of 64 seats versus 56 seats. Uh, and that's what we saw put into action uh, Monday in the Knesset. Uh, they rammed it through on clear party lines. Uh, the Kabuki theater we can get into uh, later on, the, this uh, faux compromise that came down to the very last minute uh, didn't materialize. I wasn't surprised that it didn't materialize. Um, it became an issue of principle, really, for the Netanyahu government. They wanted to push this reform or this first bill through to prove to everybody that they could, to, to give something to the hardliners, yes, 
but to show that they are the ones in charge, they're the ones governing the country and not, as they see it, uh, the mob of, of anarchists on the street. Um, again, I would very much quibble with their characterization. Um, and final point, uh, unlike late March, as we know, this was the big victory for the protest movement. Um, this time around, uh, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant did not get up there and give a primetime speech, a uh, warning of the clear and present danger to Israeli national security that would uh, befall uh, everybody if this law was passed. Um, so that didn't happen. And really, there was no general strike by the big Histogrut uh, Trade Federation, the labor unions. Uh, so really, the protesters, the idea of reservists, uh, were left uh, to on their own, and uh, and the Knesset and the Netanyahu government uh, rammed it through. Masua, turning to you, uh, this law is, of course, the first component of the Netanyahu government's judicial overhaul to actually pass. What impact specifically do you see removing the reasonableness standard having on checks and balances in Israel's political system? Initially, this was not the most high profile component of the government's judicial legislation package. Setting aside the political context and social unrest surrounding it, how concerned are you about the law itself? Hi, uh, everyone, and thank you, Susie, for um, for hosting this event. Um, so it's hard to, to disconnect the context, the political and social context for, from this law, but I'll try to do it for, um, for a few minutes. Um, it's almost ironic that this bill was the first bill or this law was the first law um, of the package to uh, go through because it was indeed the most um, um, enigmatic law, the one that was, if, if you, you go on, I mean, we, we constitutional law has become much more popular um, in the past eight months, but even in constitutional law, the reasonableness doctrine is not the most popular and understandable doctrine of all. Now, the reasonableness is one tool to supervise ministerial decisions, one out of several tools that the court holds. Um, and mainly what, what was uh, voted in this law is, um, is giving an exemption for, or giving a, a, um, an immunity for ministerial, for um, public officials, for elected officials, um, giving, they, they have um, their decisions mainly around appointments, and even decisions not to use their powers are, are now um, immune from, um, for, from judicial review, not just by the Supreme Court, by the way, but all courts um, in general. And while this is a bad law, it's a bad law. Um, it's for sure a bad law. What I fear mo most um, is, is um, that this law overtakes civil service. Um, in order to promote ultra-nationalist goals and in order to promote um, really corruption in the civil service. I'm, I'm, I'm before we are going to a dictatorship, we're going to be a banana republic, a third, a third world country, because what we'll see, it, we'll see it in the infrastructure. We'll see it in unqualified party um, officials that would be appointed to be heads of different um, of, of, of different uh, um, offices and different uh, um, really infrastructure, the, the, the statistic bureau, the, and, and we've seen attempts in, in the past few months to appoint um, uh, party officials and, and these attempts have been have been stopped by the um, by the by the um, by the legal advisor, so we see what the goals are um, in in um, in promoting this law. And again, I I do want to go back to the context because the context is crucial. It's as I said before, it's almost ironic that this is the first law that was that that was passed because one uh, way to interpret. Um, events is to say, you know what, this right wing government just had to have one success. It has, it had to gain one accomplishment, and they knew that the only accomplishment that they will be able to gain is the reasonableness doctrine, and that's why they passed it, and that's it. The package is done. No more reform, and that's it. But the problem is that no one trusts this government anymore, and we have. 
the politician after politician from the coalition that says, well, this is just the start. And the next, and the next stage is the appointment committee for the Supreme Court justices. And we see it, you know, the police, the police minister, uh, Ben Gvir tweeting on Saturday night, the salad bar is open, meaning this is just the, the, the first course in, in this, in this uh, uh, beautiful um, dinner that we are, that we are uh, proposing to the, to the Israeli public. We see Smotrich, we hear, uh, um, again, um, coalition member after coalition member saying this is only the beginning. Um, so it's really difficult to disconnect the context, the political context from this specific law. If this specific law would have passed in any other government, I would probably say, well, it's a really bad law. The Supreme Court has other tools. It still has, has other tools. And I think there would be really single cases where the reasonableness is the only tool to, um, to reject corrupt appointments. But we cannot disconnect it from the context, um, and it is only um, and it is only the beginning. Thank you. That was rather sobering, <laughs> but all of this is. I apologize. Um, no, no, it, you don't need to apologize. We're here to to learn from both of you. Um, Neri, the IDF reservists' protests and warnings from the security establishment have been a powerful element of the opposition to the judicial overhaul, and have shed light on how judicial overhaul will negatively impact the IDF and Israel security. And by the way, I just want to add, I think it was notable that Netanyahu refused to meet with the IDF's chief of staff on this very topic before the Knesset passed judicial overhaul on Monday. Um, leading up to Monday's vote, thousands of IDF reservists threatened to end their voluntary service, as we know. In its aftermath, how concerned are you about the state of the IDF and its preparedness to confront growing security threats. How do you see the IDF and the security establishment's role in the judicial overhaul saga playing out going forward? So uh, I'm extremely concerned, uh, but I'll also use this question to plug uh, the Israel Policy Pod, uh, which I host. Uh, the episode uh, that, we, that came out earlier today was on precisely this issue, uh, the impact of the judicial overhaul uh, on Israeli national security and really the, the state of the IDF uh, right now. And I uh, interviewed uh, Amos Harel, uh, the fantastic uh, defense analyst for the Haaretz newspaper. Uh, so really, uh, everyone should uh, check that out uh, if they're curious about this specific angle of the current crisis. Um, and that's Israel Policy Pod, by the way, just uh, in case that wasn't clear. Uh, no, I'm, I'm extremely concerned. Uh, you just have to look at what uh, the IDF spokesman, uh, Brigadier General uh, Hagari, uh, said yesterday. Uh, the IDF spokesman had to issue a statement yesterday basically saying that the IDF was still operationally ready for war. Um, now, this is uh, this is uh, should tell you everything you need to know uh, about what's what's happening here. Um, and long term, uh, the statement went on and you hear this from IDF uh, officers from the top on down saying that, you know, if this trend of IDF reservists actually uh, either stopping their volunteer service or making good on their threats that they have made to stop their service, uh, that in the coming weeks and months, uh, this could have major and serious and long-term damage uh, on the IDF uh, military readiness, uh, no more, no less. Uh, so in and of itself, it's extremely concerning because it's a self-inflicted internal wound. Uh, it's not like Israel was just done fighting a multi-front war uh, for three months and took heavy casualties. Uh, this is peacetime, effectively. Uh, and the IDF, uh, as we know, is assessing on a daily basis the extent of the damage uh, that this judicial overhaul bill that was passed just two days ago uh, is having on uh, their order of battle. Uh, and by the way, not just the reserves, not just the reserves, but it's seeping into um, the standing professional army, uh, you know, officers choosing not to either to stop their, their contracts or not extend their contracts. And it may even seep into the conscript army uh, with very talented soldiers uh, choosing not to go to officer training uh, courses, not to become officers. And even, uh, again, this is happening, you know, today or tomorrow or next week, but in future, uh, parents uh, either urging their, their, their sons and daughters not to enlist, or if they enlist, uh, maybe not to go for the uh, most important positions, i.e. it's a question of motivation. Uh, and really, you talk to the reservists uh, on the streets and in private conversations, and they're, they're deeply, deeply upset. These are the arguably the most patriotic Israelis, uh, true Zionists who, who sacrifice a lot 
uh, sometimes giving uh, the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, but on the very, the very least, you know, their time, their sweat, uh, their blood, uh, family life and the like uh, to this country because they truly believe. Uh, but they also believe that there's a contract, a unwritten contract, but a contract nonetheless uh, between themselves as citizen soldiers uh, and the Jewish state uh, and the Israeli government that runs the state, uh, that this country should remain both Jewish and democratic. And they see the actions of this government as not a policy issue, but a real uh, break in the social covenant here, uh, that they're undermining Israel's democratic uh, values and character. And that's that's a, a non-starter for them. Um, and again, there's a growing wave. We've see, all seen the reports, the numbers, you know, hundreds, thousands, maybe 15,000. Uh, but again, it's being assessed on a daily basis. Um, in terms of uh, the IDF itself, uh, you're right, Susie. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel refused to see his own military chief of staff for three or four days, uh, and he only met him after the vote was a done deal Monday afternoon, right? Uh, Defense Minister Gallant, as I mentioned, did not get up there and give a primetime speech warning of the clear and present dangers to Israeli national security, uh, despite them being effectively the same as they were a few months ago when he did that. Uh, and he, you know, he sufficed with uh, trying to maybe massage some kind of compromise amongst his own Likud party members. Uh, as we know, that didn't that didn't work. Um, he called up two IDF generals to go and brief the cabinet ministers at the Knesset two hours before the vote. Uh, about three cabinet ministers, according to Thomas Harrell, actually bothered to show up to hear from these two generals. Um, and the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee didn't even bother to convene a meeting or briefing, uh, as was demanded of them by opposition members, to actually assess the real implications of, of in terms of national security of what's happening here. And uh, the head of the, the chairman of this committee, uh, again, a Likud member, uh, finally deigned to convene the meeting next week. Um, so again, that should tell you everything uh, we, you need to know. Um, in terms of the IDF's role, um, here I'd argue that there is no direct role for them to take. Uh, the, the army should remain out of politics. Again, it's, it's distinct from the actual citizen soldiers and the reservists are citizen soldiers uh, making their own individual decisions. The institution of the IDF as an institution should remain out of it, um, except for the fact that we may, as Masua uh, mentioned, be arriving soon at maybe a constitutional crisis where the gatekeepers, the civil servants, and really the security chiefs will have to make a decision about who they listen to, the courts, the Supreme Court, or the government. Um, and that will be a huge, and hopefully we don't get there, but a huge moment of truth for them um, in this uh, potential constitutional crisis. Uh, but for right now, the IDF top brass, and by the way, also the Shin Bet Intelligence Agency and the Mossad, uh, 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 intelligence agency um, are also grappling with this in a slightly different way, uh, but they're all involved in it. This is a real and again, a clear and present danger to Israeli national security, what's happening here right now. And if I could just add a couple of things. First of all, um, I look forward to listening to the podcast. I read almost religiously and find him to be just a, a supreme military analyst of superb. Um, and I guess, Neri, it goes without saying that Israel's enemies are watching all of this uh, very closely, whether it be Hezbollah or Iran. I think that Nasrallah made a, a comment after the judicial overhaul passed, I uh, mean, the, the, you know, negating the reasonableness standard. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but, but you know, clearly Israel's enemies are watching the, the disarray and, and particularly what's happening with the IDF, I would imagine. Um, yeah. let's, do you have anything very, you want to on that topic? No, very, very much so. They're sitting there with popcorn in hand, uh, watching uh, the Jews uh, tear, tear themselves apart uh, for really no no apparent reason, except, uh, well, uh, we all know the motivations of this particular government. Right. Uh, Masua, back to you. While the Knesset will be on recess after this week until October, the pro-democracy protests show no signs of losing momentum, as was mentioned earlier in the webinar. Um, so how do you anticipate social unrest over the judicial overhaul playing out in the next few months as the government moves forward with steps like reappointing Arya Derry and firing the attorney general, uh, which I think we can expect that might happen? Um, and what do you expect to be at the top of this coalition's agenda when the Knesset is back in session in October? So keeping in mind that um the lack of boundaries of this government keeps surprising me. Um, I, I dare to predict that the, as I said before, the package of the judicial overhaul as it was presented at the beginning um, of the year is dead. But that does it, this doesn't mean 
that there isn't a lot of damage that is still that still um, can be done and will be done um, by this government. And that also doesn't mean that the um, continued attack of the gatekeepers, of the legal gatekeepers, of democracy's gatekeepers, um, is not going to persist and even um, and even increase. Um, even if um, this government won't fire or, or won't immediately fire the attorney general, and, and we need to remember that, again, the reasonableness doctrine is not the only um, obstacle to firing um, the attorney general. Right now, firing the attorney general is illegal, um, will be deemed illegal by the court. Um, so I, I, again, I said, I'm, I'm, I keep being surprised by the lack of boundaries, but I, I, I wouldn't anticipate, it wouldn't be smart to do that right now um, because it will, be, um, it will be invalidated by the court. Um, but even if um, these measures won't be, um, won't be taken, still we see, we have seen in the past few days the, the upcoming agenda. And it, it's not surprising if you read the, the coalition agreements right after the election. So the next, um, next two um, paragraphs on the agenda are one, the appointment committee, for the Supreme Court justices, this is number two. This is this is um, the you will say in Hebrew yahareg v'baliavo for all sides. This is the 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 um, how would you translate it, Neri? Um, like you uh, would die over it. Um, yeah. For all for all parties involved, um, the appointment committee, the the changing of the of the. Um, of the combination of the appointment committee to give the coalition um, complete power, complete control over the appointment of justices um, is the next um, is is the is the uh, next uh, on the itinerary of the government. But we can't uh, forget that also at the same time um, the uh, enlisting to the army of the ultra orthodox of the Haredi population is on the table only. Uh, a day after the reasonableness law passed, um, some members of the ultra-Orthodox, some Haredi uh, parliament members um, put forth a bill about a basic law, a bill of a basic law of the um, status and importance of Torah study, um, that it would be a, um, a supreme value in the state of Israel. Not only that, but, um, but that people who study Torah long term will be deemed as equivalent. This Torah study will be deemed as equivalent to uh, a meaningful service to the state of Israel and to the land of Israel. Um, translated, this should be equivalent to a military service, which is something um, completely <laughs> uh, um, infuriating for the liberal public, for the secular liberal public um, in Israel. Um, if this bill will not pass and, and this bill will not pass, the, the public uh, um, mayhem over it was, was really extraordinary. But if this bill um, doesn't pass, still this, the issue is on the table. So I assume that if not a basic law that entrenches Torah study, um, it will be an override clause, an override clause, because what we have in, um, ahead of us is an upcoming decision by the Supreme Court um, regarding the uh, enlistment of Haredis to the army, because right now the exemption from army service for Haredis is not entrenched in law. This has been going on for years, if not decades, that the court keeps telling the government and the Knesset that it needs to entrench this exemption by law if it wants it to be constitutional. Um, the Knesset is not doing it because it doesn't have the majority to do it or the public, um, you know, the public agreement to do that. But this is a clear um, agreement uh, between the coalition parties in the coalition agreements. Um, so this is definitely on the agenda. Um, if not in a specific basic law, then in an override clause. And I should also note, and, and we um, it, it gets out of, of, of public discourse because of the 
Um, you know, there, there's so many things on the agenda every single day, um, but there is also, um, we have the minister for um, treasury, Betsalel Smotrich is also a minister in the, um, in the um, uh, Ministry of Security or Ministry of Defense, how do you say it? Defense. Um, defense. defense, defense, that's it. Um, and right now, um, he's promoting um, a de facto annexation, which is also something that we sh probably shouldn't ignore, but it, it gets out of, of attention because there is so much, um, there is so much other things that are going on. I just want to remind our audience, and thank you, Masoud, for that, um, to please, uh, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box. We will get to as many questions as we can in, shortly. I have a few more of my own, and then I'll turn to audience questions. Uh, Neri, back to you. President Biden has repeatedly warned Prime Minister Netanyahu against making changes to the country's judicial system without broad consensus. So Neri, how do you assess the state of U.S.-Israel ties in this moment, following the passage of the law doing away with the reasonableness standard? Uh, sure thing. I mean, I should caveat my answer by saying there are probably a lot of people on this call right now who are better placed to assess the U.S.-Israel relationship than, than me, but uh, it actually ties into something uh, that I wanted to follow up uh, with uh, Masua's answer. Um, nobody knows what the next agenda items will be for this Netanyahu government, uh, least of all them, least of all them, for the simple reason that they're going to try to do as much as they can until they, they're they pushed back, uh, until they actually face real consequences. And my argument now for the last two days, when people ask me, okay, uh, what now, is that, well, uh, we, you know, it'll be dictated in terms of where we go from here on five fronts. Uh, so we touched on the protest movement. Uh, they're not looking, they're not uh, giving any indication they're going to back down. But again, can you sustain 100,000 people on the streets uh, through the dog days of August, through the kids going back to school in September, through the Jewish high holidays uh, in September and October, and then finally the Knesset comes back in, I think, mid to late October. So that's the first front. Second front, we talked about the IDF and really the IDF reservists. Will they make good on their threats? Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, Masula touched on eloquently, uh, it'll be appealed. They're going to pick up that appeal uh, in September. So we have to wait and see how the Supreme Court will rule. Um, the economy, uh, this is lost, Susie. Uh, the economy, the economic impact, uh, the credit ratings agencies have already given uh, uh, indications that they're extremely concerned. Uh, but will that actually uh, be translated into real world implications in terms of the damage the judicial overhaul is having on the Israeli economy? And then finally, uh, Susie, to, to your question, uh, what happens in Washington? Will there actually be real consequences coming out of Washington and really the Biden administration for what effectively was the Netanyahu government and Bibi himself uh, essentially ignoring multiple pleas by the president uh, to not do this, to halt, uh, to take your time, to find consensus? Uh, they did none of that. They did none of that, as we know uh, from uh, President Biden's statements to uh, Tom Friedman and Barack Ravid directly, and then other statements from other administration officials. Uh, they essentially heeded none of the warnings coming from Washington. So the question really is, uh, this front, the Washington front, as well as the four other fronts, whether this Israeli government will actually face any real consequences uh, for what they just did two days ago. And that will dictate whether they push ahead with the rest of their agenda, uh, because if there are no consequences, then um, then they're in their minds, uh, well, uh, the warnings were just fear mongering and uh, we're free and clear to actually push through whatever we want, uh, given our Knesset majority. Uh, and then in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship, look, uh, I think it's still quite strong. The only real consequence that I've seen so far is that Bibi hasn't been invited to the, to the Oval Office. Um, otherwise, I think everything else is intact. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to tell uh, Washington uh, how, how to formulate their policies. Uh, there are other people that can, that can do that. Uh, but I'll just... Uh, uh, point out that what they say, and especially what they do, has a major impact on the domestic debate here in Israel. Uh, on a daily basis, you hear uh, opposition figures and also protest leaders and even protesters on the streets with American flags and signs saying, Biden, please save us, uh, that they're looking for some assistance. Uh, now, it won't be decisive in terms of what Biden says or does, but it should be additive in terms of uh, propping up the liberal democratic majority, I might add of Israelis who want to see this country remain both Jewish and democratic. 
And so uh, it has it goes a, a long way uh, in terms of what Washington says and does. Um, and many people here uh, are looking for for some support. I'm just going to ask a couple more questions and then get to audience questions. Uh, so, Masua, back to you. Uh, while the protests have showcased Israelis' outrage against the very real threats to Israel's democracy, they did not succeed in preventing a significant step forward for judicial overhaul. How would you assess the protest movement's strategy and approach this week? Do you see this week as a defeat for the protest movement? And if so, what could it have done differently in parallel? Was there more the political opposition in the Knesset could or should have done? You know, I keep, I, I'm in the past few days, I, I cannot um, keep from thinking about the few days before the disengagement from Gaza. Uh, which were which was also always also um, around this time, and I'm I'm not I'm not really comparing between the two because now we are facing um, not a policy issue or a policy decision, but a um, an attack on Israeli democracy and Israel's constitutional structure. But still, when I looked at or or when I watched and participated um, in the protest um, movement, I saw people's reactions, and it was. It felt very close to home. Um, you know, I'm, uh, something personal here. I keep on um, being in the losing side in every 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 way I turn because I grew up um, as religious Zionist. I voted for the right when the left was in government, and right now I'm I'm like in the other side. I'm I'm opposing the government. I'm, I I keep being on the losing side. At the time, I objected. Um, the disengagement from Gaza. I also attended a protest against um, the disengagement um, from Gaza. Um, and I see people on the street and they truly, be truly believed that this bill will not pass. And people truly believe that this bill um, is the end of democracy in Israel. Um, and I asked myself whether it was smart of the protest movement to lay all the hopes and dreams and fears on this specific bill um, that, as I said before, it's it's a really bad bill and openness to corruption, but it's still not um, dictatorship. But what I wanna argue is, is a bit different here. Um, I actually don't think that it's a loss. I don't think that the protest movement lost this, um, this Monday, yes, this Monday because the choice to start with the reasonableness and not with the appointment committee was a choice that was, um, dic that was uh, dictated by the protest movement because they knew, the government knew that it won't be able to change one of the more serious, really democracy threatening bills. So it had to have one accomplishment so again, maybe ironically, this is an accomplishment by the protest movement and not by um, this right-wing government. As I'm saying this, I also want to say, though, this is a loss for everyone. I mean, the fact that the government didn't win doesn't mean that the protest movement won. Uh, right now, all sides are losing um, in Israel. And I'm sorry, again, not to be optimistic, uh, around this, I, I do think that there are reasons to be optimistic, and maybe we'll touch upon that um, later. But I think that the protest movement also um, needs to regroup. There was a lot of of um, not just rage, but deep sadness and despair after Monday, uh, after the Monday voting. Um, even though, yes, for sure, it's not the end of the protest movement by any stretch of the of the of the uh, of the way. And, but I do wanna distinguish between the protest movement and the opposition. A lot of people in the protest move, movement was, were very angry at the opposition or the politicians um, because they were willing or they were talking about compromise and they were um, um, maybe trying to reach a compromise. And a lot of, of, of the leaders of the protest movement um, are saying no compromise, not just because they don't trust the coalition, but because you know we're we're fed up, no more compromise. We are done compromising. We have been um, you know taking the burden for too long, um, and and we're done. And I want to suggest that there are two very important roles here. 
it's very important that we have people in the protest movement that are saying no compromise and we're going all the way. And it's very important that we have opposition leaders that are saying, let's strive for, let's strive for compromise. I wanna suggest here that we need both voices um, to be heard um, because at the end, we have to have an end game. And the end game would probably not be all Israel is turning liberal right now or tomorrow morning or next month. Probably it's not gonna happen. So we need to understand what's the end game and to hear um, um, uh, a spectrum of voices as to the end goal of the protest movement and the opposition combined. Buddha. Um Let's see here. Oh, okay, Neri. So as you alluded to, I think, uh, Yoav Gallant reportedly, well, not reportedly, he made a last ditch effort in the Knesset plenum. We, we could see the see the the video of him with Bibi in the middle and Gallant on one side and uh, yeah, yeah, Levin mm -hmm. on the other. Um, Gallant was trying to cut some sort of a last minute deal. It obviously didn't work. Uh, but then he, like the other 63 members of the coalition, voted in favor of the bill. So Neri, how would you characterize the state of the coalition's unity at this point? And is there, in fact, a majority in the Knesset to advance the rest of the judicial overhaul package? I mean, I think, as we saw two days ago, uh, the unity of the coalition is, is quite strong. There wasn't even one dissenting voice. Uh, by the way, unlike late March, when there were rumors that maybe Gallant and a few other Likud quote unquote moderates would actually break, maybe uh, they were never put to that test. Uh, so right now, the the coalition uh, unity is is strong. Uh, again, it won't really be tested until October, uh, but it goes back to what I said: uh, unless there are real consequences uh, to what they did two days ago, then uh, a lot of these uh, quote unquote moderates uh, will just kind of go along to get along. And not risk their political careers uh, in order to, uh, you know, quote unquote, save the country. Uh, but I, I have no, I have no real faith in the Likud. Uh, the Likud of today is not the Likud of what we remember in the past. Um, I differ slightly uh, with with what Pasua said. Um, I think we saw very clearly uh, that Netanyahu himself uh, and really his coalition uh, are not interested in any real compromise. Uh, in that sense, the more hardline elements in the protest movement were correct. Uh, we're correct. There's no real compromise to be had. You can't compromise on half a democracy, uh, and that you know you have to maintain a a, a firm line. Uh, well, in the past, I said you know in March when the in early April when the talks started at the president's residence, I was all in favor of it for the simple reason that the protest movement really started off. They weren't demanding anything except for the government to stop, to halt. So it was a very low bar. Uh, now, again, um, certain uh, more radical elements in the protest movement, especially some of the leadership, are demanding to topple the what they call the dictatorship. Uh, again, that's easier said than done. Uh, but I think the vast majority of the, the protest movement and really the protesters on the streets would just like the government to stop. Uh, and if that were the case, then the protesters would just go back home and, and try to get on with their regular lives. But that's impossible because, uh, as Masua said, nobody trusts this government, and I would argue for good reason. Uh, because they've broken every every promise they've made to not only President Biden, but the credit rating agencies, uh, to the president, President Herzog. Uh, and so, um, you know, to, to steal a uh, uh, you know, uh, description from uh, the peace process, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, uh, you know, there, there's no peace and a lot of process. There's a lot of talk about compromise talks, and we see a lot of talks and all these different negotiators like Gallant at the last minute on Monday, uh, but there's no real compromise to be had because the people in this coalition, and really I'd argue Bibi Netanyahu, um, see no interest uh, in compromising. One final question for me, and then I'll turn to audience questions. Uh, this is back to you, Masua. The Israel Bar Association, the Movement for Quality Government, Yesh Atid, and others have already filed petitions to the High Court against the law passed on Monday, and the Supreme Court announced it will be taking this up in September, but did not issue an, an injunction, as many had hoped. Do you believe that the court would take the unprecedented step of invalidating a basic law? And do you believe that it should? What would be the implications of such a move? So there were some discussions about um, the doctrine of invalidating um, a basic law, an unconstitutional constitutional amendment. Um, but I honestly doubt, and I'm not alone in this, uh, um, my, um, the majority of my colleagues who are constitutional um, law professors in Israel 
um, seriously doubt that the Supreme Court will invalidate this law. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that um, no, inju no injunction was, um, was issued by the court and only a, a, and only a discussion um, in September. Um, I doubted that the court will invalidate this law. Maybe, maybe it, it will um, keep on developing the unconstitutional constitutional amendment doctrine. And, and um, in this, it will give itself tools for a future um, invalidation of a basic law that would be more threatening to, dem to democracy than this specific law, meaning um, using this specific petition in order to build um, legal infrastructure to invalidate future laws that would be much more um, um, threatening to democracy, to the constitutional structure of the state of Israel. And I would also argue that I really, really think um, the Supreme Court shouldn't invalidate this law. Um, I'll say even more than this, uh, although it was obvious that petitions will be filed in this, in, in, to the Supreme Court challenging this law, I really, really wish petitions wouldn't be filed, wouldn't have been filed um, about this law because partly what we see this moment in time is the result of um, legalizing politics. And this is um, a sin, uh, I would argue, um, that we, I include myself inside, in, in the Israeli liberals uh, jurists um, group that for the past 30 years have used the Supreme Court in order to promote policy and politics that would not have a majority in the Knesset and in the people and instead legalized the Supreme Court and therefore um, corroded the, the uh, trust of the public in the institution. No good will get out of this specific petition. If the court invalidates it or if the court leaves it, no good um, will get for Israeli democracy will, will um, be a result to Israel democracy from this um, Supreme Court petition. There will be no constitutional crisis over the reasonableness doctrine. Over other, over, over other laws, definitely possibility. But over the reasonableness doctrine, I don't think so. Even though legally it's the right thing to do. I mean, it's not, it's not good law. It's, uh, it's unproportional, but it's not an, um, such a severe overstep that will cause, I think I would argue, and again, um, um, siding with me are other constitutional law professors who are objecting the reform who are and, and who are and who have objected this specific law. Um, but the court shouldn't um, shouldn't uh, invalidate this law. Thank you. So finally, audience questions. Uh, first and foremost from Martin Raffel, our good friend. Hi, Martin. If the reasonableness doctrine is only one of the tools that the Supreme Court has to invalidate ministerial decisions, what are the other tools it might use, for example, to invalidate the appointment of Arya Deri as government minister? I think, Masua, that's probably for you. So this is an easy one. There's um, Arya Deri declared in court that the reason that he doesn't want um, the court to decide whether his crime, whether his, um, you know, whether his um, criminal conduct had um, had the element that will negate his return to the public, um, to the public, uh, uh, um, to the political arena, is by saying, "I hereby declare that I will not return to politics." So this is a, a doctrine of, um, I, don't, I have no idea how to say it in English, unfortunately, because I didn't think about it um, ahead. Hashtag Shiputi. I challenge uh, you all to find me the translation of Hashtag Shiputi, but you cannot estoppel. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, this is a judicial estoppel. If you declare something in, in, in front of a court, you cannot just take it back or ignore it because it turns into um, an estoppel. They can also use the doctrine of, of um, foreign interests. They can also use the doctrine of, um, of, of, of unclean hands. I mean, there are many, um, there, there's a basket of tools that can be used 
um, by the court in order to um, invalidate corrupt uh, appointments. Reasonableness is one of them. Okay. Uh, from Sam Fleischacker, we have a question there. I think it's probably for you. Israel has not been a democracy for Palestinians in the territories for over half a century. And indeed, the interest on the part of the nationalist right of consolidating and increasing that undemocratic rule is one major motivation for these quote unquote reforms. To what extent do you think a call for democracy for everyone is and or should be part of the current protest movement? So uh, it's a great question. Um, we could spend an hour just on that particular issue and that specific question vis-a-vis -vis the, the current political crisis here. Um, so it, it is a part of the protest movement. Uh, if you go to Copland Street uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, you see it firsthand every Saturday. There is a uh, what's called the anti-occupation block. Uh, they're raising Palestinian flags and they're basically saying that there can't be there's no democracy, no democracy with occupation. Uh, and, you know, it's a sizable contingent, obviously um, a fraction of, of the overall protest, uh, but they're left alone. Uh, they're in the middle of it. Uh, you know, some people walk by and they're not happy or thrilled to see a Palestinian flag being raised at uh, this protest movement. But uh, again, uh, de democracy and also especially in Tel Aviv. Uh, so, so it is part of the protest movement. And, you know, you can understand the sentiment. Um, my argument, uh, and again, we could spend an hour on this, uh, the protest movement has, from the very beginning, was very intentional to say that this isn't an issue of right or left, i.e. it's not an issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and you know a two-state solution, yay or nay. They were very intentional uh, right from the beginning uh, to draw that boundary uh, because they wanted to create as wide a tent as possible uh, so it wouldn't be seen as strictly, say, left-wingers uh, protesting against the government and to draw in a lot of uh, right-wingers and also religious nationalists and uh, even some Haredis. So in that sense, that was a very deliberate uh, strategy by the protest movement um, publicly. Uh, privately, I've had these conversations and, I, and I'd argue that there is a very direct connection uh, between the pro-democracy protest movement that we're seeing now unfold in Israel uh, and the occupation and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, you know, just look at who both uh, both uh, protest movements, I, you know, quote unquote, uh, are directed against and who the, the, the antagonist is. Um, it's the very same people uh, in government now who are very actively against any kind of two-state solution, therefore not only perpetuating the occupation, but expanding the occupation, expanding settlements. Uh, and so uh, that's not a coincidence. That's not a coincidence. And for everybody looking on from the outside and kind of scoffing at these Israelis with the Israeli flags walking around chanting democracy, um, I just argue that uh, you know it, it's not sufficient for the pro-democracy movement here to win. Uh, in order to end the occupation, uh, but it's definitely necessary, definitely necessary for them to win to have any chance of ending the occupation and, and for any kind of positive movement in that direction. And like I said at the very top, uh, this is a real awakening by the vast Israeli middle, who oftentimes vote right wing, vote Likud, who for the first time in a really long time realize that maybe uh, it's not great to uh, give power and to chain our, our, our ship of state uh, to people who actively promote um, undemocratic, illiberal policies, not only in Israel, but also in the West Bank and, and other places in the occupied territories. We have time, I think, for maybe one more audience question, and then if you each want to take just a minute with any concluding thoughts, and then I'll wrap up. Um, I think this would be for you, Masua, from Joel Brown. Some have written that removal of judicial discretion to review on reasonable grounds, Knesset legislation is appropriate given Israel's lack of a written constitution. Other countries, England is an example, also do not have written constitutions yet also utilize some notions of judicial review and the reasonableness standard is employed in, I believe, the UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, maybe, a lot of Commonwealth countries. Um, do you see any merit between Israel's lack of a written constitution and the push to remove uh, reasonable judicial review? So absolutely, yes. The fact that Israel doesn't have uh, a written constitution, and it doesn't matter, it's not because it doesn't have um, a constitution, but it has basic laws. But the fact is that even those basic laws are um, are very flawed and, and lacking. Um, and the fact that uh, it, Israel doesn't have a constitution is definitely um, connected with the fact that the rejection of the or the or the uh, annulment of the reasonableness doctrine is one more threat if israel had um 
a healthy process of, um, of legislation, of judicial review, of checks and balances between the different branches, then it wouldn't be that awful to eliminate one tool and then maybe add to another one. But we, we don't even have the process to tell us what kind of change is this and whether this change merits a, um, um, a broad agreement or it can only be changed with, uh, with, a, with a, 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 um, a narrow political majority as, as was done right now because we don't have a process of legislating basic laws, of legislating the constitution. So right now we have, we don't really have three branches because the Knesset is completely controlled by the, the government. So we have uh, two branches, um, the coalition and the judiciary. And the judiciary is the only um, supervising, balancing um, 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 institute that is left to Israel. If we Every um, decrease of power uh, of the judiciary um, necessarily means less balance, less enforcement, and as I said before, more danger, not only for democracy, um, which is important enough, of course, but also for the, for the basic infrastructure of, of, uh, of our civil society um, and of our, um, and, and, of our, you know, the, 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 the fabric of the state. Neri, we have one more really good question, so we may not uh, have time for concluding thoughts, but I, this was one I think worth asking you. This is from Zach Naren. What types of actions would BB actually be likely to respond to on the part of the United States? Cutting military aid, suspending some sort of diplomatic cover at international bodies? What outside actions can actually be leveled against this government? Um, Look, uh, I like to present myself as a journalist, so I hate, hate uh, giving policy recommendations. Uh, my bosses at previous think tanks uh, used to chastise me for that. Uh, but I'll, I'll give it a shot tentatively. Uh, look, there have to be real consequences. I don't think anybody's talking about uh, cutting off military aid. Um, uh, again, uh, op-eds in the New York Times and, and other quarters, maybe notwithstanding uh, over the past week. Uh, but look, I, I, I'll repeat again, even the small gestures um, go a long way here because they inform the domestic debate and give uh, political quote unquote bullets uh, for the opposition and the protesters. So again, something as simple as not inviting Bibi Netanyahu to the Oval Office um, goes a long way, even though it seems you know somewhat unimportant. Uh, the issue of the visa waiver program, where Israelis maybe even as soon as October, again these two kind of time frames converging, uh, would go a long way because we already know how Bibi is going to spin it. He's going to spin it. Well, I just gave you visa-free travel to America, which, by the way, the vast, vast majority of Israelis care a lot more about than, say, uh, a, a settlement outpost in the West Bank. Uh, I, I just brought you this. So see, my relationship with the Biden administration is, is fine. And for, for proof of that, just look at how he tried to spin that one phone call. Uh, what was it? Last week, which he basically lied. Uh, and so Biden had to uh, address that via Tom Friedman. So uh, again, visa waivers is, is an issue that's coming up. Um, you know, and I, I'd argue again, I, I'll leave the policy right Saudi normalization is another, yeah. So, but again, that's uh, you know, I'll, I'll believe that when I see it. Um, but again, people at the very top of the Biden administration have to realize, uh, that uh, they, they do have a lot of power and influence over what happens here, uh, and they shouldn't shy away from it. And by the way, not just the administration, also Congress. Um, as I said at the very top, and this is a, probably a good concluding remark. Um, if you side with the protest movement, i.e. the liberal democratic camp in Israel, uh, you're siding with the vast, vast majority of Israelis. And so in terms of being really pro-Israel, uh, you're on very, very solid ground, uh, you know, despite the fact that, yes, the government was legally and democratically elected. Uh, it doesn't mean they have a mandate to destroy the bedrock foundations of Israeli democracy uh, on their way to uh, trying to achieve uh, what are very illiberal uh, goals that we all know what they are, uh, it's no use kind of pretending that uh, that they're not there and, and are the real motivating factors behind what we're seeing right now. Thank you, Neri. Masua, very quickly, do you have any final thoughts before we conclude? You know, I saw a, a, a joking tweet um, this week saying, uh, right now that we have no more reasonableness, let's think together about the horrible laws that can be enacted 
And then I'll start with the example. Uh, marriage and divorce can be only um, can be only uh, done according to religious law um, or the occupation. And of course, this is a joke because this is these are already existing. But what I think is, um, and these these what I said before that I do have some optimistic thoughts. Um, and to end with, is that um, this past eight months have brought to center stage the fact that Israel is already um, democ democratically flawed. And for a lot of Israelis, it was kind of convenient to look to the other side and not to think about this fact because we had our everyday life and, um, and, and the problems that only us you know, jurists and, and legal scholars talked about and wrote about were usually um, pretty transparent to a lot of Israelis. But right now, and, and I know because I when I went to my um, son's classroom to talk about what's going on in Israel in, in, the, in, the, in the US, um, it's the fifth grade and everyone knew everything about the constitution um, and, about, and about human rights. Now in Israel, you don't get that because people don't talk about the constitution, don't talk about um, 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 human rights. And the past eight months, um, there is a, um, a legal and democratic consciousness in the public and it is growing and growing. Um, and of course, there's a lot more work to do and, and these are grim days, but I think that this consciousness will definitely take us, um, take us into the future in, in a very different way. Well, thank you both. Uh, this has been a really uh, very uh, significant and meaningful conversation. And I, I we could have gone easily another hour. So we will have both of you back. Um, I also want to thank Israel Policy Forum supporters who were with us on today's call. If you enjoyed this webinar and our other offerings, our podcast, Israel Policy Pod, our weekly Coplo column, and the other useful on online tools found on our website, Please support our work by visiting israelpolicyforum.org forward slash support. For those who either will be fasting or are already fasting, I wish you a meaningful fast. The recording of this webinar will be posted on the briefings page of the Israel Policy Forum website. You can also visit the Israel Policy Forum website to access recordings of previous briefings and sign up to receive the COPLO column every Thursday. Please stay tuned for an announcement regarding the next Israel Policy Forum video briefing. Until then, Thanks again for tuning in and Masua Neri Todaraba. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Thank you.